Are people there? Yeah. 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 Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. So, uh, yeah, Dr. Master should be on in just a moment. Do you hear that echo? Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can get rid of it. Hold on a second. Is it still an echo? No, that solved the problem. That solves it. Okay, good. All right. So uh, there's somebody on there who's creating an echo, but I can meet you guys out. So I'll uh, unmute it for a few moments, and then uh, we'll wait for Dr. Master to come on, and uh, we'll make the introduction. So who's on the call tonight? Hi. Hi, Kim. It's Ellen Feingold. Hi, Ellen. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Now, see, I can hear it. Can you hear me, Kim? Yeah, I've unmuted everybody for right now. So that's why we hear I can anyway. hear you also. Oh, uh, Dr. Master, great. Okay, we're going to get started right now. So welcome, everybody, to the call tonight. Uh, this is the second part of our, our call on the homeopathic treatment of children by Dr. Farouk Master. And as always, we're very honored and very pleased to have Dr. Master. He's calling in from India, from Bombay, where it's uh, rather late, or actually it's rather early in the morning. Uh, let me, first of all, for those of you who don't know Dr. Master, let me just quickly give you an introduction. Uh, Dr. Master uh, is, in my opinion, one of the great homeopathic prescribers on the planet today and also one of the great homeopathic teachers. Um, I shared a little story last on the last call about my first experience with him. I thought tonight I would just share a, a second story, and this had to, to do with uh, his visit to uh, the United States a couple of years ago where he taught two seminars, one on the homeopathic treatment of cancer and the other one on the homeopathic treatment of children. And the first seminar was actually on the West Coast and it was uh, for the homeopathic treatment of cancer. And there was um, uh, a number of video cases that Dr. Master showed and uh, a lot of different lecture on different aspects of the treatment of cancer. But he, at, during that conference, he also did a number of live cases. And there was one woman who came in who was rather sick, she had cancer, and it had metastasized throughout her body. And uh, Dr. Master very patiently and very uh, very insightfully took the case. And then we took a break, and we all went out, and I, I saw Dr. Master in the hallway, and I could see that he was visibly disturbed. Uh, and I said, Dr. Master, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? And he said he was very upset because the woman had been treated previously by a number of homeopaths, and he was very upset by the fact that none of the practitioners had given her uh, the appropriate remedy, and he felt that the case was very clear, and that due to the fact that she had not been given the correct remedy, the cancer had now metastasized, and the prognosis was no longer very good, and he was very concerned about the woman's well-being and her ability to uh, survive the cancer. And uh, so then we went back in afterwards, and um, he finished up the case, and it was actually a, a remedy, uh, a stereo Rubin. So it was, she had uh, left-sided breast cancer, and she also desired very strong uh, cheese. And there were other symptoms as well, but he decided that it was a clear case of the Steria rubens, the red starfish. And uh, so he prescribed the remedy, and then we uh, left and went out to the East Coast for his second seminar on the homeopathic treatment of children. And when we arrived on the East Coast, we received an email from the woman saying that immediately after taking that remedy, she had this profound transformation and feeling of a weight being taken off of her chest, and that she just felt better than she had felt in 10 years. And we were just shocked that there was such a profound change in somebody who had metastasized cancer uh, in, in just such a short period of time. And uh, then more recently, about six months ago, we received another email from her saying that she's now uh, asymptomatic and has been feeling uh, incredibly well and that she really, um, really uh, owes Dr. Master a huge uh, amount of thanks and gratitude. And this is really the type of, this is who we have on the call today, somebody who, who can practice homeopathy at this level. So uh, this, is, this is a gentleman with an encyclopedic knowledge of, of homeopathy, uh, who's a great teacher, who has a, a level of compassion and concern for his fellow human beings that, that is rare among, uh, among people today. And so it was my great honor and great privilege to welcome you, Dr. Master, to this call. Thank you very much for being on. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> he seems very humble. Okay, um, so let's start. Uh, I know that you've recently written a book on the homeopathic treatment of children, and uh, I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about, uh, I know the title of your book is The Observation of, of Children in Pediatric Practice, and I thought maybe you could tell yeah. us a little bit about what is the role of observation uh, when you're treating children homeopathically? 
Yeah. <coughs> See, what is most important is that uh, homeopathy is an art and a science, you know. And uh, the art part of homeopathy is nothing but the observing the person, you know, from the point of disease and also away from the point of disease. This is very important. Now, from the point of disease, any medical doctor can examine the child from head to foot, you know, physically, weigh him, take his height and examine his various organs, do some investigation and jump to some conclusion. Well, that is a very standard format which any pediatrician or any medical doctor will do. But what I am trying to stress in this particular book is that how to observe from the homeopathic angle, how to observe the child away from the disease, and this is very important. Now, this has a lot to do with the child uh, psychology. This has a lot to do with the parental psychology. This has a lot to do trying to understand the child from a total perspective. The most important thing that one has to start observing is how is the child, especially if it's an infant, in the mother's lap? How does the child look like in the arms of the mother? How is he comfortable or not? Is he happy or not? Is he sad or not? What is the expression on the child's face? How does the newborn cry? Because there are various types of cries, you know, which are very important, which we can classify and try to understand whether it's a soft cry, whether it's a pitiful cry, whether it's an irritable cry, whether it's a whine, whether it's a whimper, whether it's a weeping or it's only crying. Which breast the child prefers, you know, there, there are certain kids who prefer one particular breast to suck. Or is the child sucking very slowly? Is the child sucking very vigorously? What is the frequency of the demand for the, for the milk, you know? When the child feels hungry immediately after nursing or is the appetite very poor? Does the child goes to sleep after nursing? Is he very sleepy after every meal? Does he go to sleep after meal? Does he smile after a meal? So all such small observation which for a modern medical doctor may not be so important, but this is very, very important. Like, I, I can give you a very small example. When the child is sucking the mother's breast, and you will see a lot of perspiration on the scalp of the child. Now, this is very, very characteristic of a Kalikap child. You know, if you can see this, in the rubric, you can directly refer into the repertory under the chapter of perspiration eating while. Or does the child refuse to suck the milk? Then this could be aversion to mother's milk. Or does the child pass flatus, urine or stool after sucking? Or what is the effect of giving a bath to the newborn child? How does the eye look? You know, just by merely examining the eye, just looking at the eye closely, you can see whether there is an element of fright in it, whether there is an element of excitement in the child, whether there is an element of sadness in the child. A sad eye will be a very small eye, where an eye which has a lot of fright in it, you know, will be very widely open. Then the position during the sleep. How does the child sleep? Whether he sleeps on the abdomen, whether he changes the position, whether he sleeps like a curled up dog, whether he sleeps with the legs spread apart. A child who prefers to sleep with the legs uh, spread apart is highly characteristic of a chamomilla child. Or does the child bore his head deep into the pillow while sleeping? This is characteristic of belladonna. Does the child grind his teeth, whether there is any salivation during the sleep? See, all such information, and the list is endless, you know. And this is what I mean by basically observing the child. Uh, this is obviously very detailed work for Rook. Uh are, are you finding that the contemporary repertories are adequate or are you having to make a lot of additions? Yeah, I, I have made a huge additions because what happens is that uh, the repertory can never be complete. You know, it needs always up to date by sincere uh, clinical physicians who observe their patients in detail. And for past 23 years, we may kept on making every single addition, you know, the color of the stool, the color of the urine, the odor of the stool, the odor of the urine. In those cases which were treated very successfully and we kept on making these notes. And this book that you are seeing now in your hands is the effort of all 22 years that we have made some observation and given it to you on a platter. Hmm. Uh, Farouk, does it mention a lot of, um, of 
common symbolic associations in pediatric practice. Can you just clarify yes. that a little bit for people? Yes, of course, of course. See, what has happened over here is that uh, you will see a lot of uh, symbolic phenomena when you are trying to treat a pediatric case. Now, the most important symbol, you know, is the dream, you know, because uh, the child will use symbolically dream to explain uh, many, many things. Children often dream about their parents' problem. The more naive and innocent the children are, the more they are under the influence of collective unconscious or may absorb the unconscious problem of the parents. Dr. Carl Jung once analyzed a man for four weeks through his son's dream. After the man became more conscious, the son ceased to dream of his father's problem. So, children's dreams are often a combination of simple, childlike, imaginary and the unconscious atmosphere of the family along with a deep connection to the collective unconscious through archetypal symbolism. I will give another example. Let's take a family where there is a lot of quarrel, where there is a lot of disharmony. The child will observe all these things, even though if it's a young child, let's say of only four years old or five years old, the child will collect this impression of, you know, disharmony in the family and this in the unconscious mind of the child can symbolize into any situation. Can sim but this symbol has got nothing to do with this, what is happening in the house. There is no direct meaning. The symbols can never have a direct meaning, a universal acceptance. Then it becomes a sign. So it is very important that you have to identify a symbol. And the child can present to you with the dreams of dogs. And you will wonder that why does the child is having so much dream of dog. And then when you try to go deep into this, that what does the dog look like? What does the dog mean to the child? And why is he selecting dog and not a horse? And if you go deeper and analyze it, you will try to identify ultimately at some point during the discussion that this is nothing, there is nothing but a disharmony in this particular aspect in the house, in the family. Next is a very common symbol which a child will pick up is the dreams of ghosts, dreams of robbers, and dreams of thief. This type of symbolism of ghost, <coughs> robber, thief, and trying to get a severe fright from them, you know, trying to trying to get a feeling that they, they are harmed by these people. They are being trying to be destroyed by these people. This type of situation when you get, again, the child is extremely insecure and you will see that there is a lot of either disharmony in the, at the level of the family or there is disharmony between the interpersonal relationship between brothers and brothers, between sister and brother, between sister and sister or there are some issues which can be discussed at the level of the school. So these are the three areas that you should try and find out because the child may not be able to express to you in a direct language as we adults do but this comes out in the form of the symbol. Then comes the symbolism in the form of what is known as painting and drawings. This is very, very important that this symbolic interpretation of child's painting and drawing. It's, it's very important that you give a color pencil or some felt pen to the child when he comes to you for homeopathic consultation and ask the child to draw something or you can demand that the mother should show you some of the drawings from his drawing books, especially those drawings which the child is very fond of. Why he uses certain color? What is the theme of the drawing? Is there any pattern which is common in many drawings? I'll tell you a case of a nephrotic syndrome <coughs> where I had seen that the child was drawing everything in the drawing which has got some violence, like a lion is eating a deer, a, a alligator is eating a man's feet, you know, something like that. Uh, uh, one animal is eating the tail of another animal. And in the drawing, there are two things which are which were very highlighted, the teeth and the claws. The child will not draw the animal properly, but the teeth always will be very sharp and very pointed, and the claws will always be very sharp and very pointed. And when we tried to understand the whole family situation, we found out that the father was a very angry man. 
the father will lose his temper very fast. Father was little neurotic. Father will, will you know, you know, at the drop of a hat will, will get excited and will blow up. This type of situation the child has observed. And this was, the, the, the drawing which the child was doing was nothing but a protection by showing these teeth and claws against the father. That if you are going to harm me, then I have a very sharp teeth and then I have a very sharp claws. And this is how I am going to protect myself. We gave belladonna to the child for his nephrotic syndrome. The nephrotic syndrome was completely cured with the help of belladonna. But the most important thing, after belladonna, the child started drawing human figures instead of animals. Child started drawing gardens. Child started drawing natural scenic things. But there was not at all any sharp teeth or claws into that particular painting. So this is very important that when you even treat the patient or a child with the right remedy, that particular symbol will disappear when the solution has been taken place and when again there is a harmony, everything will change. So okay. this is what I mean by symbolism and uh, pediatric, you know, child and symbolism. Yeah. Uh, so look, listen, one of the, I'm sure one of the questions a lot of people have is, a lot of people are here who practice homeopathy are, are not medical physicians. And, um, okay. What, what is your feeling about um, uh, examining the child physically for, to be able to come up with the correct remedy? Is this very important? Yeah, see, what happens over here is, uh, <clears throat> because I have a little, 50% uh, of my uh, practice is a little uh, hospital base. So where uh, due to the medical legal uh, aspect, uh, examining of the child is very, very important. But this is not a very important aspect, I would say, as far as the homeopathic uh, prescription is concerned. But otherwise, if, if one can examine even a little bit, I don't say that one should be a pediatrician to treat, treat a child with homeopathy. But let's say a simple examination, like... Like say you put a just simple torch in the ear of the child, you know, and try to identify where does the discharge come from and how it is and what is the consistency of the discharge and what is happening to the middle ear. Or you just, just put a torch into the mouth of the child and just look at it, whether the tonsils are enlarged, whether the pharynx is enlarged or whether it is inflamed, whether it is not inflamed. Because these are the clues which also help you to select a remedy to some extent. Like uh, you can always uh, try to examine the teeth of the child and see whether the edges of the teeth are serrated or not, whether the alignment of the teeth is normal or not, whether the enamel has been brushed off or not, whether there are, there are any caries inside the teeth or not. So it's a simple examination with the help of a torch. Uh, just you can look at the conjunctiva of the child and see whether it is pale or not, which will give you an indication that the child is anemic, you know. Or you can put your hand on the scalp of the newborn and see whether the bones of the scalp have united or not, you know. So this simple examination, I think, so I have stressed more in my book than the advanced examination of the heart sound and, you know, trying to examine the nervous system and all those things. Yeah, it's okay, but this is what I meant by importance of exam because that will lead you to certain remedies. We have got many, many pathological uh, symptoms within the repertory, so you can use of, like in the chest we have got murmur, the chapter of respiration, you will see there are various type of uh, respiration mentioned, so if you are going to only observe such type of respiration, you will be able to take, otherwise the whole chapter of respiration you may not be able to take at all, or if you go into the chapter of generalities, you will see there are so many medical terms related to diagnosis, like a granulocytosis, like anemia, like albuminuria. Now, all these things you can only take if you are trying to examine the blood of the child, you know, something like that. So, I think so. The repertory also has got a, enough evidence which you can use it, but that you can only do if you examine the child. So, that was my purpose of uh, mentioning yeah, I, the importance of examining. I, I, I think that what people are probably really getting from this is the importance of really paying attention very closely to what's going on when you're taking a child's case because you don't have the, in many cases, the, 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 the ability of the child to speak to you and communicate what's going on, so you, you have to be so aware of what's actually happening and your senses must be very acute. Um, what, Farouk, can you tell us a little bit about um, the family history? Is this something that's important when you're taking the, the pediatric case? 
Yeah. Now, see if uh, if you remember, I was just talking about this symbolism, and where I give you some example of uh, the family situation and how the child can uh, give you a hint, you know, through symbolism, where the disharmony lies. Now, because the kids don't talk, you know, much, especially if they are below five years old, a child will not talk to you. Here comes the importance of uh, trying to understand the family situation. Now, what happens over here is that there are two parts of the story. Number one is that the child himself will reflect everything about the family to you, either symbolically, either in a form of a dream, either in a form of a painting, either in a form of a toy, or either in a form of a behavioral pattern. Now, this is very important. Let's say a child who is very greedy, a child who keeps on snatching everything from others and in a form of a greed and will not share anything with anybody. You put the food on the dining table and the child will grab at the food and eat away very fast. <coughs> now where does this greed come from? Jung says that this particular type of greed definitely has to come from the parents. That at some stage there was an element of this particular greed in one of the parents. Let's take another example. This particular example will be a man who is very abusive. A father who is very abusive to his mother, a father who is being very abusive to everybody around. This particular phenomena, if it is observed by the child, the child himself can also become a very abusive. Certain bad habits which the father has, like alcoholism, like smoking, will directly portray a lot to the young child and the child will develop many, many behavioral patterns due to chronic alcoholism in the father or due to chronic tobacco addiction in the father. These patterns are very important. Now, you can only know if you study the family situation who the father is and what is the behavior and what is the attitude of the father. So, in this particular connection, I am talking about from the father point of view. From the mother point of view, the most important question goes in the form of nurturing. Problems with nurturing starts immediately after the birth, where there is no breast milk or where the mother is refusing to give the milk to the child or whether at that time, particular time, when the mother is emotionally disturbed or mother is undergoing a divorce or mother is undergoing some disappointment or some grief, that is immediately reflected on the child's psychology emotionally as well as on the physical health. As the child grows up, again, the, the behavioral pattern of a child with a single mother will be quite different than the, than the behavior of a child where there is a good harmony between the mother and the father. But absent mother, absent father, single parent, single father, single mother, all these people will definitely throw up a lot of their frustration on the child and the child will come out with certain behavioral pattern. So you can understand a lot of symptoms of the child by understanding the parents. You can also understand a lot of the children's symptoms by understanding the symptoms of the parents. So parents and child, family and child has to be studied in a you know, in a, in a united way. You can't just discrete them and study them individually. You have to see at what particular point they meet and at what particular point they separate. And the, the whole view has to be very clear in front of you. And then the prescription becomes very easy. I have mentioned many, many family patterns which were missing in other Matriya Medicas. See, because in Matriya Medicas, what you, which were written previously on a pediatric book, these family situations were avoided. But in my book, I have written in various places that what is the family situation of a Sina child, what is the family situation of a Camomilla child. And these situations are not imaginary. These situations are basically on the cured cases of Sina, where we have studied the case history, we have found the child that has improved, and then we have come to conclusion that these are the family patterns which will give birth right to a Sina child or these are the family patterns which can give birth right to a capsicum child. So something like that. Very interesting. Uh, perhaps you could uh, 
Um, there, I know in your book you have a lot of remedies that have never been discussed in this depth. Uh, perhaps you could give us an example or a few examples of some small remedies that you've seen in your pediatric practice that are, that are talked about in the book and tell us a little bit of about them. Of course. I would definitely. Uh, since uh, I was talking about the remedy uh, capsicum, uh, I would like to talk on this particular remedy which I have uh, described in this particular book. Now, capsicum is one remedy which uh, will try you have to be little careful because you can easily confuse a capsicum child with a calcarea carb and a graphitis child. So this is very important. Whenever you think of calcarea, think of also capsicum. Whenever you think of graphitis, please rule out capsicum. Most important in capsicum that I would like to look for is the change of residence, change of school or change of country or change of routine. And the child takes time to adapt to the new situation, you know. Because at the root level, the emotion is that they easily feel homesick. So this is very important that any change, you know, the child is not going to accept it so fast in capsicum. Another very important aspect is that the capsicum child are very, very touchy children, like Staffy Segria, are very, very extremely sensitive, you can say. They get offended very easily. They cannot take any joke. They cannot take any criticism. So this is very important. And the homesickness usually invites bulimia. Now, this is nothing but an oral fixation. So many times you will see that a person who suffers from bulimia, even an adult or even a, at a pediatric age group, you will see that there is some situation in the home where he is sick. It could be a simple homesickness, but if you go in a deeper way, there are some problems in the home in his family life. So any man who is unhappily married or any man who has got some problem in his house, domestic problems, emotional problems, they usually suffer from bulimia. And this type of bulimia with homesickness can lead to diarrhea, fever, indigestion, mood swings and uh, sleepiness. Sluggishness and laziness are very important aspect of this remedy, you know. So the child will hate any physical exercise, physical education, sports, you know. And that is how it comes very close to calcarea and graphitis. They have a strong tendency to procrastinate. They are too lazy. They can't take any decision. They always like to put off the things, you know. And children who feel unloved and uncared for as a result of long-standing domination or excessive strict parents. This is also we have seen in a capsicum child or insecure child whose parents may be alcoholic or drug addicts. This is the point which I just discussed with you all. And they have got a strong aversion to move out and enjoy themselves with other children of their own age. They love to be at the home. They feel the feeling is partly due to their laziness and partly because they are sensitive and they feel hurt easily if someone cracks a jokes about them. The child hates anything that is unexpected or different from his normal routine. So he loves his regular schedule, change of cradle, change of crib, change of furnishing garments, change of caretakers, even though temporary, can affect the child very severely. That is why when you see a capsicum child which is very untidy and very dirty, try to think that this is not due to a very poor hygiene, but there is a deep-seated emotional trauma which is there in the life of a capsicum child. So... This is my, uh, of course, in a very small nutshell, my explanation of the capsicum child. The rest you can read from my book. Thank you. That's very, very good. Um, Parokh, if you know, having gone through your book now um, for the last month, it, it seemed like there yeah. were a lot of things that were talked about that I had never read in any place else. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? There seems to be a lot of new things in that book. Oh, what are the new things in the book? Yeah, of yeah, course. yeah. Yeah. Now, see, what has happened is that, uh, as you know, that this book is not a materia medica, basically, but it is my experience of treating a pediatric cases for last so many years. So, the first aim that is, was there in, when I was writing the book is to how to identify 
a child belonging to a particular remedy. As you know, these remedies are not a very dead pictures in the tomb, you know, but they are the live personality. So I had to describe this personality as I have seen in my practice. But the problem was that many remedies, you know, have an image which 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 merges with another remedy's image. And hence, I have always been very careful in this book to tell you how to differentiate seemingly indicated remedies. Now, this is very important part of this particular book because I don't want you to be confused because many times the picture may look quite similar. A small example will be that when you are looking at antimony crude child, you may mistake this child with chamomilla. Because there are so many things common between a chamomilla child and an antim crude child. Both these remedies, you will see that the child is angry when touched, child answers snappishly, child don't like to take a bath, bathing in any form aggravates, they cannot bear to be looked at, they love sour food, the face is red, they've got fear of touch, milk does not aggravate both aggravates both the child, they are highly obstinate, sweets aggravate and tongue is coated white. So you will see that so many common things are there between these two child but when you are trying to really trying to differentiate between them then you should remember that the chamomilla child loves to eat bread while an antim crude child loves to eat cucumbers. Chamomilla child has got disposition to frown Chamomilla child has got marked fear of wind. The face becomes red only when there is an anger. And there is no daydreaming. Daydreaming is a very important aspect of antim crude rather than chamomilla. Chamomilla is abusive and impatient. Antim crude is on the lazier side. Chamomilla is rude. Antim crude is sentimental. So this is how we then differentiate. But this is very, very important part of my book that I try to you know, guide the readers that don't get confused with the picture of this book. Secondly, as I have told you, the new thing about this book is describing the whole family situation. Not only the family situation, but trying to identify a child in a family, trying to identify a child in a school, trying to identify a child in a society. This is very important. So, as you know, the child has got three important places. Society, school and family, where you can identify a particular child. I have tried to describe all the three situations. Of course, there are many filling the gaps, you know, because the book is not a very complete book. But what to do? You know, you have to, this is the first attempt and I have tried to explain. Maybe in my third or fourth edition, I can give you many more situations regarding this particular aspect. Another important thing is the examination findings. Very minutely, I have given my all examination findings through either investigations like blood report, CT scans, X-ray chairs, blood cultures, or simple examination like when you examine the scalp of the child, you will see crusty eruptions, or simple examination of the eye, which will show you conjunctivitis or crack in the canthi, or the eyes are sunken, or the eyes are protruding out, you know. And so this examination part is another important thing. And at various places, I would like to give you my interpretation from child psychology. So I use many psychological terms in, in the remedies which will try to help you. I have sometimes even made use of the Hollywood movie themes, you know, where, where in Magnesium I have said that this resembles Oliver Twist, you know, something like that. So I have tried to use certain themes of movies also to explain certain remedies or I have tried to take some example from the history and put it into the remedy so that the remedy picture becomes much more glorious and, you know, shiny. So these are the characteristics of my new book. Thank you, Farouk. Are, are, there, Farouk are, there, are there other books that you would recommend for people to read that could help them also in the treatment of children homeopathically? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, this is very important. Uh, there are certain books which are worth reading if you really want. Now, there are two parts of the story. If you want to read anything from the medical point of view, you know, then there's a very nice book, uh, Understanding the Child by Ealing Words, you know. Can you say the name again? And, uh, by uh, trying, Understanding the Child, Understanding the Child, yeah. the Normal Child, the Normal Child. There are two books 
the normal child and an abnormal child. Both are by the same author, Illingworth. Uh, Illingworth, I double L I N G W O R T H. Illingworth. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, then uh, you can look under the book by uh, ob observing a baby, observing a baby or observing the child by Desmond Morris. You know Desmond Morris is a hmm. he's a British uh, uh, I think so naturopathic uh, physician. Uh, yeah. He has written a lot of book on dog watching, cat watching, animal watching, baby watching. So then there's a very nice book on uh, how to raise a child by Dr. Mendelssohn. How to raise a child by uh, Dr. Mendelssohn. It's a small book of six dollars or so but very nice book. And uh, another good book, uh, I think so, which has uh, come out uh, in homeopathy very recently is uh, The Dreams, Symbols and Homeopathy by Jane uh, Cicchetti. Yep. This this will tell you something on symbolism. Yeah, that's a very good book for us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a, the common book will be The Symbolic Quest by Edward Whitmont. That is also a very good book which will help you to understand something on child psychology. This is from the opposite aspect. Now, if you go from the homeopathy path, I would say that one should uh, read the Materia Medica and articles uh, written by Elizabeth Hubbard, number one. Everything to do with Dr. Borland. The Borland has written a very nice book on children types. So, this is one good book, but in fact, any book, any article written by Borland is extremely useful. It's a gem. Then the next would be the the Essences by Vithulkas, you know. George Vithulkas has written about uh, seven to eight volumes on the, you know, Essences and the detailed book, you know, the Viva. The All the Viva, seven yeah. volumes of Viva, yeah. They are, they are excellent. Then Kandegabe. Kandegabe has also described his comparative Materia Medica where you can find some good, uh, useful information. Then N.M. Chaudhary textbook on Materia Medica is also a piece. Uh, then I would say about Margaret Blackie. Margaret Blackie also has written a book on homeopathy where she has described many pediatric remedies. So I think so. This is also very good. And then Farrington, Materia Medica, I would strongly recommend. Articles by Forbister. Forbister has written a very nice book, Forb Homeopathy and Pediatrics by Donnell Forbister. So this is very good, nice book uh, which will help you. I'm going to just tell for the people who are on the call, it's F-O-U-B, just so everybody knows. Yeah, Forbister. And uh, another book uh, which is uh, worth uh, trying to understand uh, or trying to help you will be by Jolly Men. Uh, will be by Jolly Men. I think so. That is also very good. Uh, and Jolly Men has written a book on uh, the childhood asthmas, you know. So this is very good if one wants to try to master that particular aspect of asthma. And uh, I think so if you read the EH, you know, there are many nice articles written on pediatric, uh, uh, you know, pediatric uh, topics, you know. So if you just put a word children in the search of EH, you will get some very useful articles and these articles have also been very useful to me and uh, the Nash, Nash is one really good book, the leaders, you know, the leaders in, uh, leaders in typhoid fever, leaders in respiratory organs, you know, or leaders for the use of sulfur, all these are masterpieces, you know, which has helped me to uh, understand many good uh, pediatric remedies. Then Pulford. Pulford is one author which I would recommend to you, especially Pulford pneumonias. Because in my practice I see lots of pneumonias and upper respiratory tract infection. And this book, very small book by Pulford, is extremely useful to me. So or I would use the repertory as well? Yes, a lot. Uh, as you know that uh, I'm trying to you know, use exclusively synthesis uh, repertory which is being authored by Frederick Scroins and I use radar in my practice. Now I think so more I think so more than ten years that I'm using this program and uh, this has helped me a lot. Believe me in my development, in my understanding, in my research work, in my writing a book, 
while giving seminars, you know, this has been a, a part of myself, you know, I would not separate Radha from myself. Uh, for, perhaps you could tell us um, about some children rubrics in the repertory that you use and, and that are useful to you. Of course, yeah, I think so. I'm not very really sure, but there are more than 800 rubrics of children. <laughs> but uh, if it's, uh, I'll just tell you some highlights which I know by heart. If you open the chapter on mine, you know, you can always start from the letter A and you will see a lot of abuse and children, you know. So this is very important. And uh, and then you, if you go down, you will see on affectionate rubric and you will see the children who are, you know, are, are highly affectionate child, you know. And, 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 and you will see that one of the most affectionate child that we have seen in our practice is a car- carbo wedge. And you will be surprised because... You may expect that many like carcinosin and phosphorus, but we have seen carbovet children also. And then you will look at the ailments from, you know, the rubric ailments from, and you will see the fright in children, you know, where we have mentioned about opium as a remedy. And then you look under autism, you know, another very important thing, and awkward children, then love for animal in children, biting fingers, biting nails, the very big topic on that. On, in the mind you will see offer that and then you will see under delusion you know this is a very, very nice uh, rubric uh, the area in the mind where you should study you know that the delusion that the ch- child is falling or child is neglected or delusion wrong suffered especially in a children you know if you get a feeling that the child has wrongly suffered then a very useful symptom of naja you know and uh, then you got discontented children, you know, and then fear in children. There's a big chapter of uh, uh, fear. And uh, let me tell you, once there was a very nice case where we saw, saw strong fear in a child while passing stool because it was extremely painful. And you will see my addition, the remedy is Nux Vomica and Sulphur. So many many new symptoms in children I have added in this particular rubric and referring repertory as really help me. Then hyperactive child. This is very important. Uh, hyperactive child, you can see. Then absent mother, absent father. Lot of psychological rubrics you can refer. Manipulative children, meddlesome children, monomania in children, precocity in children, sensitive children. These are all from the mind aspect. If you go in the head, you will see hydrocephalus, inflammation of brain in children, inflammation of meninges in children, Injuries, you know, in the children, which is a very common thing, or boring the head into the children, or school-going children headaches, you know, or the child's scalp is very, you know, sensitive to the brushing, which you see in day-to-day practice. In the chapter of eyes, you will see a lot of inflammation, you know, related to the child, you know, because eyes inflammation, children, you will see immediately my addition of antimony crude, you know. So this is very important, which we have added up. And then uh, you will see ulceration on the cornea in children, where you will see calcare iodide we have added in that particular rubric. And then in the ear, in the ear and nose, I think so. In the ear, I think so. There's a hearing impair in the nose. You will see adenoids and coryza and nose obstruction and snuffling and chewing motion on the face. And, and there are many, many. Let let me tell you. Let's go to the chapter of generalities, and I will show you some good rubrics and in general it is you will see related to vaccination you know problem the albuminaria you know the weakness in children due to albuminaria this is a very very strong symptom of nephrotic syndrome you will see in the remedy psychotico and uh, in general it is you will also see uh, septicemias and uh, stoop shoulder children and obesity in children children with a lot of neurological problem and uh, and food this is very important Desire for uh, meat in children, you know, you will see magnesium carb as a very important remedy. And uh, desire for water in children, and you will see senicula, which happens to be addition from uh, Margaret Tyler. So I think so there are more, about more than seven to 800 rubrics of children in the synthesis repertory. It only requires practice to see them regularly, and definitely the use of radar program will help you to search in few seconds everything about children. Thank you, Farouk. Listen, one of the things I love about the book that you wrote is uh, the differentials that you do on the remedies. It's, to me, it's one of the 
to me, it's the way to study homeopathy and the way to, because it's the way we differentiate in practice. Maybe you could just share uh, two remedies that are commonly sim- similar indicated remedies and uh, how you would compare and contrast them. Okay. This, I'll give a very small example. Uh, <coughs> Econite and arsenic, you know, because uh, they resemble quite a lot in fear, fright, and anxiety. Now, <coughs> these two remedies at a distance will look very similar when a ch- child has a fear, fright, or anxiety. But arsenic child will become anxious when anything is expected out of him. And this fear and fright and anxiety in arsenic will be always be worse in evening and night. This is very important and especially when they are alone. While the anxiety of Econite is always associated with with stool, with urination, while coughing, and is more in the forenoon. The, the, the time period is very important between arsenic and uh, Econite. Arsenic is usually in the evening and night. Econite is usually in the forenoon. And the most important thing is that anxiety, fright, and fear comes more in a company and more in a crowd in Econite, while in arsenic they are always when they are alone. This is very important. Arsenic needs company to remove the anxiety. Econite develops anxiety when in a company. This is another important thing. And Econite child they always feel better by cold drinks. If you give them a cold drink, ice cold water or Coke or Pepsi, they feel much better in their anxiety in Econite. Arsenic is a chilly patient. Econite, as you know, is a hot child. In arsenic, you will see a lot of fastidiousness. Econite is not at all fastidious. The fears are, if you, from the superficial thing, you will see that the fears are quite same between the two remedies. But in an econite, the fear is more related to crowded places, music, passing through a tunnel, passing through a narrow bridge, crossing the street. These are the very hallmark fear of econite where arsenic will not exist. While the hallmark fear of arsenic where econite will not exist is fear of being alone, especially when going to bed. Or fear everything that is black in color. That is very important in arsenic. Or fear of high places, fear of insects, fear of robbers. These are the highly characteristic uh, fears of uh, arsenic where you won't find econite. So this was in short a differentiation between these two remedies. This you will see on page 118 of my book. Thank you, Farouk. Um, I know you've, you've done a lot of research into Freudian and Jungian psychology. Um, do you yeah. use these a lot in, in uh, your pediatric practice? Pediatric practice? Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm developing myself uh, since last many years. I'm trying to understand and read Jung in whatever little way and whatever little time that I have at my disposal and try to correlate and verify the facts. Basically, I'm uh, trying to only put into practice what Edward Whitmont has written in all his books, you know. And this Jane Chikati book is a, another big help to me in my practice. And I'm trying to combine all these things and see how the things work and how clearly I can understand remedies, especially those remedies which has not been proved nicely, you know, or some unusual features of a very nicely proved remedy. So... This is my approach. Thank you, Farouk. Um, I'm going to uh, unmute the call now and uh, uh, let the, the audience ask questions of you because I'm sure that people have been very um, uh, stimulated by this uh, conversation. But before I do that, I just wanted to give uh, uh, Alice an opportunity to let people know that that, that she that you can get the book through CHR Books and I guess also the Jane Chiquetti book. So, Alice, yeah, you the still... Jane Chiquetti book is available. Um, it's on, you know, the website. Um, the titles that um, Dr. Master mentioned, the things by Hubbard, Borland, Kandagabi, Jollyman, those are all from a wonderful series of books published by Beaconsfield in the United Kingdom, and we have most of those titles available and more coming all the time. So uh, lots of those are available on the website, or you can call me toll-free for more information. We have Nash's Leaders, Pulford, of course. We've got the Chowdhury textbook. Those things that uh, Dr. Master um, mentioned in the homeopathic vein are all available, and I will be looking into um, seeing what I can find out about locating things like Gillingworth's understanding the normal child and Desmond Moore's observing the baby. 
um, Mendelssohn's book, How to Raise a Child, was available for quite a long time. Um, it seemed to sort of drop out of favor for a while, but I think I can probably track down copies of that as well. So can you tell the toll-free number, Allison? So yeah, the toll-free number is 866-599-5950. And the website, of course, is wholehealthnow.com slash books. So any of your questions? And just to let you know, we will again offer what we offered on the first teleconference. If you order online Dr. Ferro uh, Dr. Master's book, and if you write in the special instruction line that I listened to Dr. Master, we will take $5 off the cost of the book for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Allison, you always amaze me with your knowledge of books. It's really fantastic. Dr. Master, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on to the to the audience now. And uh, sure. on one second. Okay, so are there any questions anybody would like to ask? Yeah, I've got one. This is Joanna Brown from Vail, Colorado. Hi, Dr. Master. Thank you so much. I've got yes. a five-month-old baby boy, kind of a calc carb disposition big blue eyes, a um, little, you know, overweight, fair skin. He had eczema really bad at birth. Um, the mother was on a cyclovore, a herpes medication. Cool. Hello? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Yes, I'm hearing you. Okay. The, the mother was on the herpes medication then? Yes. Yeah, so before I prescribed a remedy, I had her, I recommended, I should say, that she stop that. Because um, okay. I look at the side effects, and she started taking it the day um, she conceived, throughout yes. the whole pregnancy and throughout the whole nursing. Okay. It's gotten about 50% better. She's been off of it about a month and a half, but it's yes. still. I mean, it's. I mean, covered head to toe. I mean, he was born with peeling skin. Okay. Um, and your question is. Well, I guess my question is, um, do I look more of, of who he is and his essence and just kind of not really look at the skin condition at all since it seems like it is, it was brought on by that? Her first child that was two years old didn't have that at all. She was only on the medication two weeks before birth, so she wouldn't pass it along. Baruch, did you, did you understand the question? No, I didn't hear. I understood her story, but what's the question? I guess the question is, for me, the best way to come up with a remedy, since it's still there, it's only about 50% better, should I okay. wait or should I just look at basically the essence of yeah, the child? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, 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 I'll share with you my experience. Uh, what is important is these are the atopic eczemas, basically. Now, in this atopic eczema, the first thing that I would recommend is that uh, the LM scale medicine is excellent compared to the centesimal. And uh, we have a special dosage method for LM scale for child with uh, atopic eczema where we just put one granule of the medicine in a glass of 200 ml of water. We stir it 20 times. We take one drop from that glass and put it into another glass of 200 ml of water. We stir again 20 times. We again take one drop from the second glass. We do this till five glasses. And then after the fifth glass, we just give one drop to the child. Now that becomes a test dose for the child. And basically, we try to find out how the child reacts to that. We try to judge the susceptibility of the child with this. And then, as and when the child reacts favorably, we don't repeat it. And if we see the child susceptibility is very good, then we start repeating the remedy, you know. So this is what first important thing is the using of LM scale. The second thing is that using the medicine purely on a constitutional symptoms, trying to avoid as much as possible those rubrics of the skin as such because that will only bring you back to certain skin remedies in totality if you try to analyze them. But most important thing here I would take since the eczema is since the birth, anything that starts from the birth or within few months after the birth, it is very important that you put some symptoms of the mother's state, which is very, very characteristic, or certain family situation, which you feel are very strong at the time during pregnancy or at the time of birth. Those situation needs to be understood for such a case. So try to base a prescription taking those symptoms rather than to take very local symptom of the remedy. 
and some if there are some miasms, you know, very strong miasm running in the family, then a miasmatic prescription will be far more better. And the third thing is that this this is usually run a very chronic course, so you have to wait for four five years more to completely remove this thing from the child's body. Thank you for so me. yeah. Thank you. Do you use? I'm sorry, honey, but I'll talk to you after this is done. Okay? Uh, any other questions? Yes, yes. What size globule do you use in the LM? Yeah, I I I use LM potency in in lot of my patients. Number one, I use LM case uh, potency in patients who are suffering from advanced cancer. Uh, as you know, I did my uh, MD in, uh, with dissertation in uh, oncology, so I treat lots of cancer patients with uh, advanced pathology, and LM scale has really helped me because I can then repeat the medicine very safely without producing any medicinal aggravation. In various skin disorders where there is a very strong sensitivity, like atopic eczema or allergic situation, I use LM scale a lot in psychiatric conditions. People who are on long-term psychiatric medicines like chronic schizophrenia or compulsive obsessive disorders or maniac depressive psychosis, these people are usually on a long-term allopathic drugs, you know. And I find that the giving homeopathic drugs at that time may not have a very good effect on the vital force because Either if you give a centesimal, it may over-aggravate or it may produce some symptoms of aggravation or it may not act at all. So LM scale potency will go much more deeper and at the same time you can repeat them very frequently <coughs> without the fear of any aggravation. So I use LM scale a lot. What size globule do you use when you... What, what size it, do you it, use? We... Uh, Normally use the globuli, which is of the size number 10. Okay. In India, we use size number 10. Thanks, Karo. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Would you I have use a question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. The lady who had a question? Yes. Um, I, I'm curious if you've had any success with treating... Um, uh, a small child, approximately 18 months, two, two years old, who is very healthy physically and emotionally, um, except that he loves to bite everybody. Um, I've wept it, and I tried him on Belladonna, 30C, and 200, uh, absolutely no results, and I'm... Uh, I am stuck. I don't know what, how to treat him. <laughs> yeah, I, need, I need, need to know a lot of history about this child before I can answer you this question. You can email to me the whole history, and maybe then I can help you. Okay. What, let's have one more question. One final question. Do you use the LM doses for adults the same as children? Yes, yes. The dosage uh, usually remains the same. Uh, I have written a book on bedside organon, and in that particular book, I have mentioned all my views on potency. So I think so. If Kim has this book, he can supply you this book, bedside organon, second edition. Yeah, we we definitely have that. Okay, well, I want to thank you again, uh, uh, Doctor Master, for uh, getting up so early and being on this call today. I know that uh, people really enjoy these calls. It's, it's just uh, a great joy for me to, to have the opportunity to speak with you, and uh, I'm sure that we'll, we'll be doing another one of these in the near future. Uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be on this call and, and to learn from Dr. Master, and uh, please uh, stay tuned for future calls. We'll be having a lot more of them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Master. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Uh, what is Dr. Master's email address? Oh, you know, call me tomorrow at 707-822-5807, and I'll, I'll Write that you down. 707-822-5807, and I'll give you his email then. Uh, once more, 707-822-822. Yes. Five There's eight. an echo. 
Okay. I know. It's 707-822-5807. And your name? My name is Kim. Kim? Kim, K-I-M. Kim. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Thanks, Kim. Bye. Bye. Hi, Kim. Yeah. Kim? Yeah? Is it possible to get a list of the books that he mentioned? Uh, yeah, you know, it seemed to me like if you call Allison at the toll-free number, 866-599-5950, she, she, she knew that list backwards and forwards. Okay, hey, Kim? Yeah. Uh, last year at one of the workshops that you held that I was at, um, we talked, well, actually it was Farouk's last year, uh, we talked about him putting, are you adding to um, Radar his repertory? Yes, those editions are going to be made available fairly soon from our website. Excellent. Yeah. Will, will you email about that? Or? Yes, of course. We'll let everybody know. Okay. And then, Kim, uh, I'm planning on coming, by the way. To Arcata? Yeah, to Arcata for the Oh, is it Judy? This is Judy. Oh, Judy, great. Yes, I, I saw that. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm so, really uh, excited you're coming. Yeah, I'm excited about it, too. So okay, I'll talk honey. to you uh, I'll talk so call to Call me later tomorrow. We'll touch base and work out the logistics. Okay, perfect. Sounds good. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.